Yo, Dietrich Lavers, what's poppin'? It's time to do a similar calculation to what we did in the Deriving the Quantum Electrodynamics Lagrangian Density video. Though it's slightly different, we're going to be developing, in a sense, a more sophisticated version of the same theory. Really, everything about it is the same, except for the fact that the symmetry group is enlarged. So, last time when we were uh, working out the quantum electrodynamics Lagrangian, basically we were developing the minimal U1 gauge theory consisting of a gauge particle and a Dirac fermion coupled to it. And U1 is a very simple group, it's an abelian group, and what we're interested in doing now is asking the question, what happens if we enlarge the symmetry group uh, to SUN? What happens? It's a non-abelian group, so different things are going to happen, it's a much bigger group. So we want the SUN generalization of electromagnetism. Now, because we're generalizing an existing theory to one that doesn't already have well-established gauge field equations, namely the Maxwell equations in the case of U1, the approach we're going to take is a little bit different, but ultimately the goal is similar in that we're looking for a minimal gauge theory consisting of Dirac spinners coupled to a series of gauge fields that is SUN gauge invariant. The process that we're going to use to derive this theory is very much inspired by what we learned from developing quantum electrodynamics. Specifically, in quantum electrodynamics, we started by noticing a U1 global invariance in the Dirac Lagrangian, and then we asked, well, how can we make it a local symmetry of the theory? And we developed this way with covariant derivatives that used gauge fields that transformed in the necessary way to make the theory locally invariant under U1 symmetry transformations. And then we notice that the transformation property required for this gauge field happened to be exactly the same as the U1 gauge transformation property of the four vector potential and electromagnetism. So we simply identify the two things and took the kinetic term from the Maxwell Lagrangian to be the dynamical Lagrangian of the gauge field in this new quantum electrodynamics. So what we're going to do here is notice one more key feature of electromagnetism, and that is that we can commute covariant derivatives applied to these Dirac spinners to yield the Faraday tensor. Now the Faraday tensor is composed of the electric and magnetic field. It's therefore just a tensor that gives the strength of the electromagnetic field. So it is often called the field strength tensor. So we get this key relation that the commutator of gauge covariant derivatives applied to these Dirac spinners gives you the field strength. So then what we're going to do is we're going to take this derivation of QED as an inspiration, a clue as to how to go about deriving an SUN version of it. What we're going to do is we're going to take the Dirac Lagrangian and generalize it so that it has a global SUN invariance. Specifically, we'll assemble isospin multiplets of Dirac spinners that transform the fundamental representation of SUN. Then we'll develop covariant derivatives using gauge fields that make this globally SUN invariant Dirac Lagrangian locally invariant under it. Then we'll take those covariant derivatives and commute them to get the field strength, and then basically square the field strength to get the kinetic term of the Lagrangian. There's a nuance there, but we'll get to it in the math section. If we remember correctly, we just took the Maxwell kinetic term to be the dynamical term for the electromagnetic gauge boson. And that just consisted of the square of the Faraday tensor, the field strength tensor. So basically that's telling us what we could have done is taken the commutator of covariant derivatives and squared the field strength tensor that resulted to get the dynamical term for the Lagrangian. So that's basically what we're doing here in this QED inspired derivation. So now here's the math section where I'll explain the technical details of doing all of this. Before moving on to Yang-Mills theory, there is one more aspect of electrodynamics that must be noted. Remember from the last video that the quantum electrodynamics Lagrangian density in natural units has this value, where f mu nu is the Faraday tensor given by this formula in terms of the four vector potential. The Faraday tensor is also called the electromagnetic field strength tensor because its components are the electric and magnetic fields, and therefore this tensor does exactly what it says on the tin. It just gives the electromagnetic field strength. Also, the gauge covariant derivative is given by this formula, 
where E is the charge associated with psi, and I am using the opposite sign convention for the gauge term compared to my last video. Doing this changes nothing very meaningful. In fact, the convention used here seems to be the more common one. The key new piece of insight that I mentioned above as being prerequisite for deriving Yang-Mills theory comes when one evaluates the commutator of covariant derivatives applied to psi. One can see that this commutator yields the field strength. This idea of commuting covariant derivatives to get the field strength tensor of the theory is very analogous to gravity. Remember that in gravity physics, one commutes space-time covariant derivatives applied to a vector to get the Riemann curvature tensor, which is just the gravitational field strength tensor. It is possible to take this analogy quite far. One can define an abstract space, usually called gauge space, whose parameterizations correspond to gauges. One can then call the field strength tensor the curvature of gauge space. One can consider the general covariance of GR, invariance under arbitrary coordinate transformation, to be its gauge symmetry with gauge group GL4, the group of four-dimensional arbitrary coordinate transformations. Coordinate systems are then the gauges and space-time the gauge space. Space-time covariant derivatives are the gauge covariant derivatives. This connection between differential geometry and gauge theory is a very deep one in field theory. The key fact from above, however, is that commuting gauge covariant derivatives gives the field strength tensor, where the gauge covariant derivative is defined as the derivative operator that, when applied to a field, yields a derivative that transforms like the original field. Of course, there is a nuance in the case of gravity physics where the covariant derivative adds another vector index and therefore transforms as a tensor of one higher rank instead of identically, but it is still the same in that the covariant derivative still transforms like a tensor, and that is the important thing. Yang-Mills theory is very similar to Maxwell's electromagnetism in that it is a gauge theory based off of a unitary isospin group gauge group, but it differs in one important way. The gauge group is taken to be SUN instead of U1. The goal is to construct the simplest free space vector field Lagrangian density that has a gauge symmetry consistent with the multiplication table of SUN instead of U1 and has no higher than second order field equations so as to yield a unitary quantum field theory. In short, the goal is to try and see what happens if one enlarges the gauge group of free space electrodynamics given by this Lagrangian from U1 to SUN. The approach to answering this question that is taken in this video makes critical use of much of what was learned from constructing the Lagrangian density of quantum electrodynamics. This includes the relationship between the covariant derivatives and the field strength tensor introduced at the beginning of this video. Our need to make use of this relationship in constructing Yang-Mills theory and quantum chromodynamics was the reason for introducing the quantum electrodynamics version of this relationship at the beginning. Let's review the process used to construct QED. A global U1 invariance in the Dirac Lagrangian was noticed. The global invariance was upgraded to a local invariance using a gauge covariant derivative that achieved covariance through the introduction of a new four-vector field called the gauge field, which was taken to transform in the manner required to yield invariance of the Lagrangian. Given the identical U1 gauge transformation properties, the gauge field was taken to be the electromagnetic four vector potential, and its dynamical Lagrangian was taken to be the free space Maxwell Lagrangian given here. This Lagrangian represented the required unique U1 gauge invariant Lorentz invariant and unitary gauge field dynamical Lagrangian. It was then noted that F mu nu is given by the commutator of gauge covariant derivatives. This means that the gauge field dynamical Lagrangian could have been derived by squaring the field strength yielded by a commutator of gauge covariant derivatives. This process gives us a plan of attack for our first attempt at constructing QCD slash Yang-Mills theory, the SUN generalization of quantum electrodynamics slash electromagnetism. This approach will turn out to work, so it will also be our last attempt. Specifically, the plan is to modify the Dirac Lagrangians slightly to give a global SUN symmetry. Specifically, the goal is to construct isospin multiplets of Dirac spinners that transform globally under the fundamental representation of SUN. Upgrade this global invariance to a local one by introducing a covariant derivative, one that includes 
new gauge fields which transform in the manner required to yield gauge covariance for that derivative and invariance for the Lagrangian density. Evaluate the commutator of these covariant derivatives to obtain the field strength, then square the field strength to get the gauge field dynamical Lagrangian. It turns out that the trace of the square must be taken to yield a gauge invariant scalar. You'll see what I mean when we get there. The gauge field dynamical Lagrangian will turn out to be the unique gauge invariant Lorentz invariant and unitary SUN gauge field dynamical Lagrangian. It is the Lagrangian of Yang Mills theory and the direct SUN generalization of electromagnetism. If one replaces SUN with U1, the Yang Mills theory collapses down to electromagnetism. The SUN gauge invariant Dirac Lagrangian added to Yang Mills theory is the Lagrangian of quantum chromodynamics. Let us now perform this process suggested up here. First remember that the generators of the fundamental representation of SUN satisfy the following Lie algebra where lambda a are the Gelman matrices in the case of SU3 but are a larger or smaller set of matrices for other SUN. Now one can define an isospin multiplet in the fundamental representation as follows, where this is, of course, a unitary matrix. And because of that, the transformation of the adjoint spinner is naturally just that, where this lambda matrix is given in terms of the generators in the group parameters by this exponential and standard Lie group manner. If one takes this isospin multiplet to be a multiplet of Dirac spinners, and their Lagrangian is given here, this Lagrangian is like the original Dirac Lagrangian, but with a global SUN symmetry, with the Dirac field transforming the fundamental representation. Next on our list of steps is to upgrade this to a local symmetry using covariant derivatives and gauge fields. This can be done with the following gauge covariant derivative here, where these lambda matrices are now dependent on position, specifically through position dependence on the parameters here, which control how much rotation in isospin space actually occurs. It can now vary with position, and also it can depend on time. This is representing dependence on all the coordinates of space-time. So in order for this to actually transform covariantly, the way this generator contracted with gauge fields quantity needs to transform is actually like this, which is equivalent to saying that the gauge fields themselves have to transform like this. Now it might not be immediately obvious how this transformation relation for the gauge fields contracted with the generators is consistent with the direct gauge transformation of the gauge fields, but it actually is consistent. You can see in the following way that it is. So we have this combination here, the gauge fields contracted with the generators, and we can multiply it by another set of generators on both sides. Then we can take the trace of both sides, and then remember this identity. Applying it, we finally get the gauge transformation of the gauge fields on their own, and we see it actually is what's given above. Now, to see that this really is the gauge transformation that's required to make this derivative actually covariant, we can literally just plug it in. So if we go from d mu to the gauge transform d mu, which can be written in terms of the gauge transform psi and a mu like this, and then we just plug in the values for the gauge transform psi and a mu as established above, we find that this actually does uniquely collapse it down to this which means that it is the transformation you have to take a mu to have in order to make this gauge covariant derivative actually transform covariantly. So then with this fact established, we can immediately write out the gauge invariant Dirac Lagrangian. We see that psi is going to give us a factor of omega of x and d mu psi will also give us a factor of omega given this transformation relation that we just established, and we've already established that this will give omega inverse of x, and making the parameters dependent on position in no way changes that, obviously. And so then that will cancel the omega of x that comes as a factor on each of these two terms.
and as a result it's gauge invariant. Step three from the above list consists of commuting the covariant derivatives to get the field strength tensor. Simply directly commuting them gives this value for it in terms of this g a mu nu, which can be written like that, in terms of the gauge field. The easiest way to work out this gauge transformation relation for this g i j g mu nu quantity, this field strength tensor, is to factor the generators into the formula for this g a mu nu. Immediately we can rewrite the derivative terms in terms of just a mu, which if you remember, a mu is just defined as the gauge fields contracted with the generators. Then this interaction term between the gauge field and itself can also be rewritten purely in terms of the a's. And the way you do that is you replace these structure constants contracted with the generators, which you'd get when you factor this through, with a commutator of the generators. Of course, there's a factor of i you need to deal with, but that's trivial. Then you can multiply this through the commutator and get everything written in terms of just a mu. Then, once you've done that, you can quite easily plug in this gauge transformation relation and simplify down. And what that ultimately gives you is this gauge transformation relation here. So it's a bit of algebra, but it's pretty trivial. Now, of course, in principle, you could do it just by substituting the gauge transformation properties of the gauge fields directly into this, but that's harder. It's easier if you first factor this through and rewrite it in terms of the a mu instead of the a, a mu vectors. It makes for easier algebra to do. But regardless, the net upshot is this is how the field strength tensor transforms. The final step consists of squaring the field strength tensor to obtain the gauge field dynamical Lagrangian, which you see here. The factor of minus a half is a convention. This Lagrangian is gauge invariant because of the cyclic property of the trace and the gauge transformation of these g's. Now, this isn't quite as simple as what was done with the electromagnetic case where we could just directly take the square of the field strength tensor and go home. Here, the square of the field strength tensor is actually a matrix, and so you need to trace it to get a scalar, and also specifically getting a scalar by taking the trace yields gauge invariance because of the cyclic property of the trace. This is the Lagrangian density of Yang-Mills theory, and it is the unique gauge invariant, Lorentz invariant, and unitary SUN gauge field dynamical Lagrangian. So if you look at this and say, well, why just take the same process that worked for electrodynamics? Why is that valid? Isn't there other possibilities for Lagrangians that you could pick that would have all the right properties? Why is this one the one that you pick? And the answer is because it is the unique gauge invariant, Lorentz invariant, and unitary SUN gauge field dynamical Lagrangian. Of course, you can obviously like take squares of this and higher powers of this, or even transcendental functions of this. You can construct other invariants, but you need ones that yield a unitary quantum field theory. And it turns out that all three of these restrictions applied at the same time has only one solution, and that is this. So it's by going through this process of commuting the gauge covariant derivatives and getting the field strength and then squaring it, of course there's the nuance with the trace, that you get the only answer that's satisfactory. If one takes the special case of SU3 and then adds it to the local SU3 invariant Dirac Lagrangian, one obtains the quantum chromodynamics Lagrangian density, which is the experimentally correct theory of the strong nuclear interactions. Here's the gorgeous Lagrangian here. Of course, I've only written this for one quark. You'd have to take multiple copies of this term with the appropriate mass for the other five quarks if you wanted the full quantum chromodynamics as it appears in the standard model, but that's just a trivial generalization. So that is how you derive Yang-Mills theory and quantum chromodynamics. So now you've seen the math portion. Basically we looked at how we derived the QED Lagrangian density and took that as inspiration for developing 
a process by which we might obtain an SUN gauge theory that's very similar. And it turned out it worked. It gave us exactly what we were looking for, a Lorentz invariant gauge invariant unitary quantum field theory Lagrangian density, although we didn't quantize it, that we could either take as just a Lagrangian for pure Yang-Mills theory, or we could add it to the SUN gauge invariant Dirac Lagrangian and take it as the Lagrangian density for quantum chromodynamics. And of course, quantum chromodynamics has been found to be the theory that accurately describes strong interactions. So that's how it's done. Dietrich out. Oh, one last thing. Don't forget to subscribe.